is good everybody and welcome back to the second episode of under one roof it has taken us about 30 minutes or so during the pre-show <laughs> kingdom was a little bit late i've been talking to our producer matt we've been trying to make sure the script is going to be in good working order apparently twitter is dying kevin durant hates all of his teammates in season one for call of duty has recently come out which means that we have got a lot of things to talk about also, also, I am joined by my great and wonderful co-host, Mr. Anthony, a.k.a. Kingdom Soldier. How are you today, sir? Or tonight? I'm uh, doing well. It's been a long day. There's a lot of news to talk about. A lot has happened between last week and this week, so I'm excited to talk about it today. Uh, I also like the fact that we have these lovely solo shots. Perfect timing. I was waiting for him to go to me just to make sure that we have them. <laughs> so we're, we're making some little upgrades. We've been taking some feedback, and we greatly appreciate uh, everybody who was able to watch the last episode uh, saw some wonderful comments. People talk about how, hey, this is really what I want to see, a sports and esports podcast that kind of come into one, uh, which is what we're aiming to do here. If you're new, this is your first episode of Under One Roof. That's exactly what we're here to tackle, Buckle sports up. and esports. We're talking NBA. We're talking Call of Duty as our main subjects and uh, and jumping into other things progressively along the way. But it's stuff that, that uh, Kingdom and I both love to, to talk about. And honestly, it was like, you know, I'd love if somebody made a podcast where you talked about both. And that's exactly what we're here to do. We're here to talk about the stuff that we like to listen to and like to watch. And one thing that I have liked to watch Kingdom, but have also hated to watch, mm. has been this this firestorm of the Nets. Like, it has gotten horrible, it's gotten better, and then it's gotten horrible again. And with this recent article that's, that has come out from Bleach Report... <laughs> Uh, I don't know what to think anymore, man. I mean, KD is, he's calling out everybody. Like, what is this? So, like, honestly, um, it's refreshing to me. Like, uh, I will say that I'm glad that KD told more of the story of why Steve Nash, why he wanted him removed, why he wanted to trade and wanted to go to another team, uh, why he thought it was important to voice his concerns, and why this team is still struggling today. And in part, in the article, he really just goes on to say, like, we weren't practicing enough. Uh, we weren't spending enough time doing things. And what I liked is that he took personal responsibility and said, like, a lot of people get this impression that I'm, he didn't say like Braun, but he's like, that I'm basically saying that everybody needs to play around me and come to my level and everybody needs to play better like me. He was telling Steve Nash, like, hey, cuss me out sometimes. Yell at me. Tell me I'm not doing the right thing. You know, tell me I need to do better rotations in front of the other guys if it'll make people work harder. Make us do more practice. Like, we're not prepared enough to win in the NBA. And we have learned so far this year that he was right. <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> that is fair. They're not winning. Uh, but also, not a whole lot of other teams are winning either. Now, like, I like some things from this article. Honestly, some of the things that you said I did... Uh, I thought, like I said, it was refreshing. However, there are a few, like, interesting quotes that I have taken from this article, and I'm just going to pick out one of these, which was, and this is verbatim, I, I literally copy and pasted the quote onto what I'm reading off of, which is this. Look at our starting lineup. Edmund Sumner, Royce O'Neal, Joe Harris, Nick Claxton, and me. It's not disrespect, but what are you expecting from that group? You expect Yikes. us to win because I'm out there? So if you're watching from that lens, you're expecting us to play well because number seven is out there. So he basically said, you know what? <laughs> this is our this is our team. You know, we got this guy, we got this guy, and we got this guy. Now it's no disrespect, but nobody expects us to win. What do you like <laughs> you can't say that? That's the problem that I have. No, do you can't I say understand? That. Do I almost side with KD on this? Absolutely. Like he went to the Nets for things. For him to win he went there to go with major players so he could win championships and right. honestly all of that has gone wrong however <laughs> i don't know if i would go out there publicly and just being like you know what the guys that we have right now no disrespect but we're not gonna win like uh, yeah that's that's what like... you want to hear from your leader <laughs> like you can't have that <laughs> It's like if uh, if we were starting the show and we we're like, I mean, you know, <laughs> look at our starting three. It's me, Landon, and Matt. Like, what do you expect us to do? Like, <laughs> like, how are you not supposed to take offense at that? You know, like that's actually, I think that's hilarious, and it's interesting that you called that out. And again, what impact is that going to have on the team and them their ability to play together? It's here's the funny thing: the the chemistry problems that 
and I know we're going to talk about the Warriors, the chemistry problem that the Warriors have, the chemistry problem that the Lakers have, the chemistry problem that the Nets have. It's interesting that these phenomenal individual talent are having problems when it comes to team chemistry in the NBA right now. I, I feel like not that things could get better because they're not going to get better. I, I, I mean, like, I think at best, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, I think at best, right, it's already rumored that Kyrie Irving is going to be coming back, which I actually don't even know if that's good for KD right now. Um, I don't know if things necessarily get better, and like I said, I think that the ceiling for the, for the Nets right now is like maybe second round at best. Like, I think that they make the playoffs, but at best they maybe hit the second round, and that's their ceiling. And so it leads me to this. I think that little things like this are going to continue out of KD until something dramatic happens. Whether it's the Nets remove players, you know, they start making changes, or uh, if Kevin Durant just ends up saying, essentially, I won out. And I think that that is a very real possibility. I think that right now, like, Kevin Durant is, is basically mad at the fact, he basically said that the, the practices aren't good. Like, okay, yeah. I get it, right? Like, the practices aren't, you know, good. Steve Nash wasn't telling me to, to you know, to, to run across the floor, you know, to do all this stuff. I get it. I think that Kevin Durant wants to be given a schedule and just wants to play basketball. And I think the place where he can do that is not with the Nets, but instead, realistically, could be in a place like Golden State. And that's, I will Whoa. leave it there until we talk about the Warriors. Because if we're talking about what he needs or what he wants, I think we all know what that is. You're wait, okay. So I did not expect that that's where you were going to land. I was like, where yep. is he going with this? Like, what team is he going to land on? So <laughs> you're telling me that you think Kevin Durant, do you think he's suited for that team? And he, do you think he's also, dang, he actually also is what they need? Nobody would be able to stop them. Because I, I don't, I, again, I, I want us to be able to move on. I don't want us to talk too long about yeah. the Nets without talking about the Warriors because I know I just brought it up. But if you are looking at both team situations, you know what? We'll just talk about from KD's perspective, right? Like we said, he wants to be obviously with some more well known players. He wants to play with stars. He wants to play with a key figure piece. And to be honest, I think he likes to kind of be, you know, one of the highlighted teams to talk about. But I think he's tired of all this drama. And who can blame him? Like, you came to this team with Kyrie Irving. You wanted James Harden. James Harden, James Harden ends up leaving. Then you want Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons doesn't play. Ben Simmons is back. Ben Simmons isn't great. Kyrie Irving's gone. Kyrie Irving's back. Like, you never have any consistency. And I think what he is so desperately looking for is for someone to say, hey, Kevin Durant, show up to practice tomorrow at 7 p.m. for your scrimmages and for your shooting. And by the way, we play the Bucks on Thursday. Get ready. Like, I think that's what he's looking for. And I don't think he's going to have that with the Nets, given how wild that it is over there right now. And like I said, with, with Kyrie possibly coming back, I don't know if this actually gets better because as a constant preseason favorite, they are going to have the spotlight. And, un, you know, it's, it's almost not fair. It's almost difficult from Kevin Durant's perspective. But with Kyrie coming back, I mean, Keenan, we know. Like, everyone's going to be talking about the Nets. Everybody is going to have a spotlight on this team for reasons that I'm sure KD isn't happy about. Yeah. I mean, and it's a deserved spotlight, right? Like this team was put together. There's a whole bunch of jabbering and talk that went on when KD went over to that team. And when those changes were made and um, there's a lot of, you know, we didn't need you to win a championship that happened last year. And a lot of people said, look, they didn't need KD. KD got a lot of flack at the end of last year when the Warriors did win and, uh, the team that he went to has continued to dwindle. And there was a lot of people actually saying, and I think Stephen A. Smith was one of them, um, that Kevin Durant's not a good leader. Like, he can be a part mm -hmm. of a good team that has a good leadership structure. And and like you said, he just wants to play. Like, And he wants to play in a system. But he's not the guy to make the system. He's not the guy to encourage and create the system. He doesn't know how to do that. So he's begging his coach, Steve Nash. You know, He's begging the GM. He's begging people around him like, hey, we need to be better. We're not good. Like, yeah. do something. Uh, and that's honestly like, that's his lack of leadership ability is just him saying like somebody else fix it, you know? And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I am, I'm intrigued to see what happens here and how this last trades are going to be interesting this year overall. You know, people are still thinking like what's going to happen with like Westbrook and what's going to happen with KD and what's going to happen with Kyrie and where are these guys going to go and what are they going to do? And, 
Uh, I'm really intrigued by KD actually coming out and saying this. And it's interesting that he decided to say it on the back end of them catching a giant L where <laughs> I think they were down by like 50 in that game at one point. You yeah, know? They, they allowed and for the Sacramento Kings to drop 153, which... Uh, is, uh, wow. I think Bleacher Report <laughs> called it a trouncing, which I would uh, I would also use it, as a uh, as an it, accurate... It, as an accurate it, word for what exactly happened. It was a trouncing. You let another team score 153 points. <laughs> That's pretty bad. But honestly, like, and I know we're going to talk about it, Warriors defense is just as bad. Like, uh, there's yeah. a lot of teams right now that can score but can't stop other teams from scoring. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of teams I feel like that we're talking about right now that all have marquee players that I wouldn't be surprised, again, if we start talking about how they start to intertwine with each other, how trades can start to happen, which we'll talk a little bit more about. By the way, I didn't mention at the start of the show that I think what we're going to start doing is kind of having these major subjects that we talk about at the start of the show. So one for the NBA, uh, one for the CDL or for Call of Duty, and then we'll kind of jump into a running list of topics, and who knows? We'll just see how far we can get. Okay. So we talked about the major one, obviously that being uh, Kevin Durant. Going off on the nets, essentially, and uh, what I believe will possibly be a call for a trade not long from now. Who knows? Maybe it's just, just going to take another 152-point uh, trouncing uh, to maybe make that happen. I don't exactly know. Uh, moving on, though, to something, I guess, a little bit more happy. There have been positives. There have also been negatives <laughs> uh, with this going down. Is uh, Season 1 has officially started for Modern Warfare 2. That means Warzone 2.0 is out. DMZ is out. The CDL Mosh Pit, fortunately, has been delayed. Uh, but a lot of big news going on with Call of Duty. Uh, not exactly in terms of like, hey, the CDL is starting and matches are being played. But with the game itself, uh, I've been playing a lot of Warzone. I'm sure a lot of people who are watching this have been playing a lot of Warzone. One mode that a lot of people, I guarantee, might just avoid or may like play one game of it and then just be like, eh, I don't really know what this is. I've heard a lot of people say it's like hardcore Warzone. And it kind of is. It's DMZ, which is like a similar game type to like Escape from Tarkov for those who have... um seen that maybe watch like summit or shraz when the bigger streamers play it uh and whatnot i have loved this mode lately uh and i am very interested to see a lot more people kind of uh play this experiment with it honestly use it for uh uh for content i think is great i've actually been playing it for the last two days with miles um and stuff and it has been a blast uh but what are your initial thoughts on the uh season one so far can you know, i'm not sure have you have you played a lot or have you been doing more watching nope. than anything uh doing a lot of watching have not played i've also seen you know while twitter is available um <laughs> <laughs> for now right uh, uh, yeah on the clock I, I saw some uh, cdl skins get tweeted out and it was interesting to see uh the minnesota rocker tweeted out a tier list of cdl skins that was pretty <laughs> hilarious <laughs> um oh i have to see funny. this i'm going to it right now <laughs> yeah I'm going you to this right now it's actually hilarious. Sounds like a uh, producer is going to pull it up for us. So um, I'm interested in, you know, like I thought that was pretty hilarious because they just gave everybody their own topics. And like um, a couple of them were like about, you know, joining a rave and, you know, beans, <laughs> beans on toast was like the Ravens. And, you know, of course, Min Minnesota's like Twitter game. I'll say like I'm sad if Twitter goes somewhere because Minnesota stepped it up like towards the end of the year mm -hmm. uh, and when they weren't at champs and uh and then going True. into this next season like they at least had some inspired social posts you know and uh so i saw some of that um warzone 2.0 like i watched it i, I did watch miles and, and you play and i of course watched like huskers and aiden yeah. and the guys that you know joe Wo, um z laner had a horrible time with the game, uh, basically died every 10 minutes to the point where he had to tell Dr. Disrespect, like, hey, uh, I'll be back in an hour. I'm going to try to figure this out. You know, he <laughs> his game just kept crashing. And it seemed like some people had that problem. I saw a ton tweet that out, I believe. Yep, his game yep. kept crashing. And so I saw people talk about their game kept crashing. And then there was other people that seemed to be fine. I watched, uh, I, I watched Mavens crash a lot, but he was in a game with... Uh, with Merck and Crowder and the guys, and not all of them were having the same problems. I watched Symphony play, I watched Courage. Like I tried to peek at everybody to see what their experience was and if they liked it. I feel like without the crashing, they liked the game. They thought the mm -hmm. looting was a little bit off, but I feel like they liked the game overall. They liked the map. It plays like Warzone, um, but it is a bit different uh and most of the complaints i saw were like bug related rather than well we just don't like this and we just don't like that and i wish i could slide cancel and 
I didn't hear a lot of that. I thought I felt like at first people were actually excited, like, wow, this is cool. Oh, this is cool. Oh, I actually like this. I did watch one person that said they couldn't find any money. They were like, there's no money in this game anywhere. <laughs> um, and so it's like, I think people's thoughts were interesting to me. What was an weird response to this game being released, which you can talk more about, I'm sure, Landon, is it seemed to have a negative impact on the CDO. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I, I honestly, I haven't been able to really jump at any private matches. I know right now, at least as of the recording of this, uh, I know that, like, social is currently bugged, uh, which basically means that it's difficult to invite players to lobbies. Uh, I want to say that the CDL modes have actually been removed from private matches yep. uh, not long ago. Uh, so that's currently being worked on. So teams haven't been able to scrim. Now it's like they cannot currently scrim. Uh, so that has obviously been a, a big problem. I know the uh, Challengers Cup number two is coming up this weekend, so there's a lot of questions on whether or not players are going to be able to play. I'm sure that the CDL is uh, is working on things like that is, is, in, in tandem with it. And then, like, I know there were some updates, you know, when it came down to, like, footsteps are now somehow louder and the M4 uh, has received a buff. Different things like that uh, are definitely questionable, but I would say just in general over the entire season one from my perspective is that I, I i understand in some ways right i understand the fact that you know what when a when you have a massive launch right you're launching warzone 2.0 you're launching dmz you're trying to to launch mosh pit which is also you know very um it's hard right it's, it's kind of our yeah. mode then now we have customs that are messed up and then now we're hearing that you know footsteps are louder which is a bigger problem already it's it's unfortunate, and like I said, I do understand the the pains of trying to make these other modes. At the same time, it just is such a it is so unfortunate that all of the negatives of all of these things it feels like are are directly impacting uh, the competitive side of things. And uh, obviously, yeah. I hope that that stuff ends up changing soon. And to be honest, I mean, if if things don't right, if if footsteps continue to be louder, if the M4 is buffed, if we can't even play in matches or scrimmages and things like that, you know, there probably is going to have to be a delay on the uh, on the Challenger Cup. And that's just, you know, some of the growing pains that we've learned to have to deal with when it comes down to, to COD launches is just trying to be aware of, I know the CDL is so conscious of wanting to make sure the season can start as soon as possible, right? That is that is what we want. Like, I think that from a yeah. fan's perspective, from a commentator's perspective, I want the game to start as soon as possible um, because there are so many fans who are interested and engaged with it. At the same time, though, there are these pains that you have to go through um, when it comes down to stuff like this. And so it's going to have to be that balance and... I, I, I'm not usually one to like be like, oh yeah, look at the, you know, look at the light, look at the, you know, the positive of, of this. But maybe as time goes on, as seasons progress, maybe we could start to kind of fine tune uh, when that time should be, when when season starts um, and whatnot. And maybe it's not as early as where we are right now. Maybe it's a little later. Maybe it's even a few weeks later, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously not happy at the fact that teams cannot scrimmage, nor can they really even play CDL modes right now, given uh, friends list being messed up and um, given the fact that CDL modes are just no longer in it for the moment. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I feel bad for the competitive players that are having this negative impact. It's like, we got what we wanted in the season starting sooner, but it obviously the reason that the season took some time to start is because these kind of things needed to be worked out, <laughs> you know? So it's kind yeah. of like, it, it's kind of a catch 22. I do want to pull up, um, um, producer says that we have the rocket on a brighter note. available. So for those of note. you that are, are watching <laughs> and not listening, this is the tweet from the Minnesota rocker. You knew it was coming. <laughs> Their tweet is the best skin yet. Uh, the LA Thieves tweet, which is true, is the rose, like the 2.0 of the rose oh. skin, the oh all black. My gosh. Um, where's the rave? <laughs> which is funny because <laughs> the Seattle Surge responded to this tweet with like the, the raving kid dance yeah. that's in the club. Uh, Halloween was memed. last month. That is hilarious. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wannabe rocker skins for the other purples. Uh, buzz Buzz. That's for the, the best the one. That's the best one. New Which York. One? Buzz Buzz. That is, buzz Buzz. It, they, they do look like a bumblebee. Like it's yellow and black. I, I, like, that's facts. You know what? Like Mary Chrysler. Um, Canadian skier Fortnite skin. Look it up. I did not look this up, but probably accurate. It does. It does look like I can get beta those. skin 2.0. You guys, what what is that one? Like, I know it's the optic one, but what's I don't know why they called it beta skin. Is that? I don't know either. Okay. 
Oh, got it. There's a beta skin that looks like it. And then beans on toast. For They had nothing to say. There could about have been the something Raven. funnier for that one. There could have been something a little funnier with that one, but it kind of <laughs> so, works. So, like, honestly, I, I, um, I think Warzone is going to be a good title. I think Warzone 2 is going to be great. Um, while we're at it, we didn't put this in the script, but why not? Uh, Warzone Mobile was dropped on the Apple Store today, uh, and it has already reached 25 million downloads. That was just oh on Google. Gosh. And so we're probably going to cross 50 million when now that Apple's dropped. Uh, I definitely preloaded it onto my phone uh, and waiting. Now, what we know is, unfortunately, Apple put a date of release of May uh that you can all everybody can see but also when something hits the apple store it rarely is going to be more than 90 days for it to be released so look forward to something you know there's something that's going to come maybe a beta is going to roll out uh and of course there's an eager there's eager excitement about the ability to play uh warzone mobile on your phone and to go back to verdansk which is the map so uh, that's really exciting. And I think Warzone 2.0, I think by this time next year, like the number, Call of Duty is going to have like five top titles on your phone, uh, on your PC, wherever you want to play games. Uh, there's going to be top Call of Duty titles there. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the Warzone 2 season because I know that there's going to be all kinds of events and World Series of Warzone and all this kind of stuff's going to drop. Um, and it looked like, like Huskers was definitely better than everybody else he was playing with. And so the guys that are good, they're still good. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, some good gameplay. You know, Kingdom, I'm proud of us. You know, it's 21 minutes and we've gotten through two topics. This is good. This is good. Yes. I'm proud of us. You know? I am too. Look at us. This, we we need that solid. look at us, like the, the, you know, the meme. Yeah, we are doing the hot nice. ones thing. And it's like, look at us. Look at us. You know, that was like, or our producer was talking about how he was eating spicy food earlier. And it just reminded me of that. He already said his name. We might as well just call him Matt. Like, yeah, I guess so. Let it, cat we, out of the we've bag. exposed him. We have exposed him. Maybe he'll maybe he'll pop up on the show at some point, uh, voice wise. Never video, but you know, audio. He'll be that voice that just. We got him on video before. In the sits past. among us. We have. Once, yeah, we have indeed. Twice. I don't think he liked it, but you know, <laughs> we'll. We'll, we'll try to keep him happy for for the moment. Uh, something that does, okay, I, I I'm not good at transitioning from topics to topics in terms of like, oh, this makes me happy, this makes me sad. But something that really does make me sad actually uh, is that Steph Curry dropped 50 points for the loss versus the Phoenix Suns. I'll be honest, I was watching this game and fell asleep. Um, I did fall asleep watching it. But at the moment, <laughs> Steph Curry was already on a heater. Uh, and this is already just a remark of the fact that it's another team that has seen their struggles. We talked about this last week, right? It was like, okay, Warriors in a little bit of a slump, right? Maybe not playing their best basketball. Oh, Steph Curry looks great. You know, he's looking really good right now. Uh, putting up some unbelievable numbers. And things are still going wrong. They have yet to win a game on the road. Thankfully, they've been solid at home. Uh, but a record that just does not, I guess a record and honestly just a performance so far from the team kingdom that just already early on into the season, people are already starting to put a panic mode on the Warriors because like James Wiseman isn't even like playing. I think he's like in the G League right now. Uh, you yep. have multiple players who are just not still living up to the same hype. And I will say this, I'm going to hand it off to you. I will say this about the Warriors is that I, I don't necessarily blame the franchise. Normally, like when you talk about the Nets, you know what? You guys made that mistake, right? That's your problem. You decided to add these players. You decided to do this. You got big personalities. You knew what you were getting into. For the Warriors, you can't blame them, right? They just won a championship. And what they said is that, you know what? We're going to run it back. Cool. You know why? Because you have a bunch of young players who should be playing well. And they don't have that, right? Who would have thought that Moses Moody, Jordan Poole, James White, like all of these guys are playing worse than they were last year. And Clay Thompson, who I thought was going to be instantly better, everybody and, and, and everybody was saying, oh yeah, well, Clay Thompson, you know, good. He'll be much better next season. He's not. And right now, Steph Curry is doing everything that he possibly can. He's putting up even better numbers uh, than his unanimous MVP season years ago, and they're still not seeing success, or at least as much success as they should. So I don't, I don't even know if I blame the Warriors franchise. I think this is honestly on the players. 
You know, last week when we talked about this, we brought up the Draymond punch and how it may have impacted things. And honestly, uh, I think it's just going to take this team some time. You know, uh, they have the third, fourth worst defense in the league. Yeah. Uh, their starting five is number one. Their next five are last. So it's kind of like <laughs> in plus minus. Like their bench is horrible. Their starting five are amazing. And it's like, how do you have a team that is that opposite? on the floor together They're yeah. on one team, but they can't play together. And so Steve Kerr, I don't know if uh, you noticed, but he also came out and said, this may be the last year we see Draymond, Steph and Clay together. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not this year, it's probably next year. And he was like, when you have, when you win championships, it helps weather the storms and the ups and downs. Like this team would have split up a long time ago if they didn't win championships. It's the same thing with Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili and, and Tony Parker. They would have split up earlier in their long tenure together if they wouldn't have won championships. And so winning championships definitely can make things feel better to where it's like, hey, this isn't working, but let's still stick it out. You know, yeah. uh, this team is still together, in my opinion, because they won a championship last year. If they didn't, maybe Draymond would have left. You know, uh, I think things get more expensive. Guys get more expensive. And those pieces, you just can't keep them. And so... I hope they figure it out. If I'm honest with you, this is really a weird stat that they're six and one at home and zero and eight on the road. Like, it's like the opposite. Like they and what that means to me is that they're younger guys when they're not performing in front of a home crowd that's cheering them on. They can't deal with it. They just struggle, you know, because the starters are doing the same job everywhere. And for Steph to drop a fifty piece, but the only quarter they won and that was by three points is the fourth quarter. That is a problem. Funny enough, you said you fell asleep. I watched the first half, watched watch Steph not miss a single shot yeah. from three-point. He missed one shot overall, hit every three-pointer that he shot, and I was like, this game is chalked. Like, the Warriors are going to beat the Suns. The Suns, all along, were just like, I mean, it's great that Steph is seven for seven. It's great that he's four for four from three, but we're still winning. They went into mm -hmm. halftime like, yeah, Steph's going off, but who cares? And... Honestly, that is a problem. This is like old school young LeBron when he was dropping 50 pieces and teams were still beating them and they got to the finals once, you know, yeah. uh, and got smoked by the Spurs because team ball wins. This is a league where team ball wins. And my curiosity is what the heck do the Warriors do? Steve Kerr is finally mixing in starters into the rest of the lineup. I think Andrew Wiggins, in all honesty, like needs to be mixed into the a different lineup or yeah. I, I don't think you can not start Draymond, but I'm also noticing that defensively this team struggles a lot when it comes to defense and they don't have the pieces to defend big men that are very effective. And I think DeAndre Ayton was able to do whatever he wanted, you know, like, and he, they just went to him repeatedly, like repeated. And then it, it was interesting at the beginning of the game, the Suns had more free throws in the first 10 minutes of this game than they did in the previous game. They only had four free throws in the previous game. They had six free throws within the first 10 minutes because they were aggressively going at the Warriors because everyone in the league knows, like, the Warriors foul too much. And Draymond Green has said it. Like, we're, we, we defend lazily, especially the second unit. And so, team has a lot to work on. Um, I, Steph Curry is an, is an all-time great he is a one of the best point guards in the league right now. Debatable between him and some others. Uh, very entertaining to watch. Uh, very disgusting. But his team can't back him up. He doesn't have help. And Clay isn't a splash brother. He's more like a splash cousin right now. And so it's just <laughs> not working out. Cousin. <laughs> I think that should be like definitely like quoted it started it's starting to to be used i know like people were talking about like the map pools like a map puddle they're like this they're like the, the oh my god i don't know it's not the a good situation puddle. it's not a good situation uh right now for the warriors man and like i said this this kind of brings me to the same point like does adding kevin durant to this team solve all their problems yeah. no but i mean if you can put a package together of young players that honestly are just not productive right now. Maybe you could form a package and get them over for KD. Maybe you could actually get worth 
out of your secondary, out of your bench in some way that doesn't involve them playing, but instead for what they could be. Now, again, you'd really have to be careful with this because it's like, you know, do you want to include Jordan Poole in this? That may be the only way that you get the deal done. You know, do you want to include Draymond in this? Do you even want Draymond to be on the team if Kevin Durant comes over here? Because like we said, you know, nope. KD is kind of ex is hoping to leave uh, Drama Central, not enter in toward another opportunity for where it could happen again. Um, at the same time, though, you're thinking of, you know, starting players. Draymond could be good to have on this team if we're talking about defense, if we're talking about all of these things. Uh, I think that it's something yeah. that... I don't know if it's going to be taken seriously or not. I think that Kevin Durant, without question in that article, uh, is essentially saying, I'm ready to leave. Like, I'm I'm ready to get out of here. Um, and with that being the case, I think that a destination for him should be Golden State. Now, I've always heard this quote, and I will I will take it in this situation for the Warriors. Do you make this move if you're Golden State? Can you even make it? Let's just say they could make it. I don't know. But do you have a conversation about it? Absolutely. Like, you absolutely have a conversation about possibly bringing on Kevin Durant to this team. Because the last thing that fans or uh, season ticket holders, people who have investment in the franchise, the last thing that they want to see is this team, right, who just won a championship, all of a sudden has lost their mojo. And honestly... A lot of the blame is going to be tossed on to Draymond, and he may not even be here next season. And so you're having this career year, and if Steph Curry, honestly, so far to start off this year, it could be his best start to a season he's ever had. Like, that, that is wild to think. You do not yeah. want to waste this season, and at the same time, you don't want to waste what's going on with Kevin Durant either. So, by bringing these two back together, if that could even be possible, I think you absolutely have the conversation about bringing in Durant. I think you absolutely have a conversation about making moves already uh, if you are the Warriors. Again, because it just feels like, for whatever reason, it's one of the weirdest things that's going on right now in the NBA is this group of young players that we all thought was going to be the deepest team in the NBA, if not one of the deepest teams in the NBA, and it feels like there's like a Space Jam situation going on. Like, what happened to all their skills? Like, <laughs> what what is going on right now? It is a weird situation to be in, but... I think that you at least talk about it. I think you talk about trying to bring in Kevin, uh, trying to bring in KD in. And like I said, I, I don't think that you want to waste the current season, the current productivity that you're getting out of, out of Steph Curry right now. Because if he's playing like this, or at least playing similar to this kingdom, he can lead a team of decent players and a consistent team far in the playoffs. But if this team yeah. keeps playing the same way that he is, if he's dropping 50 points for losses... This team's not going to go anywhere. Or their ceiling of being in the playoffs is not going to be high, considering how deep so many teams are out there in the NBA. Before we move on, one of the things I'll say is that last year, I thought this team was done. Um, I, could, I read body language, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I was like, Draymond, Steph, and Clay don't want to play together anymore. Like, they're done doing this. And even after they won, if you notice, you go back and watch the video of when they won the championship. There was crying by Steph. There was walking around. They didn't hit up each other for a good couple of minutes. There wasn't like this immediate, let's go hug each other. Like we did it again. It was kind of this weird, like, it was almost like when you saw the Optic Dynasty win sometimes where it was like, wow, do they even like each other? Like, yeah. <laughs> like they don't even want to dap. They're just going over to talk to the other team. And so, like, I think the writing is on the wall. Um, it's kind of like how FaZe looked at the end of the year last year. Like, it was just very it looked like they didn't want to play together, but they just happened to win against all odds. And that's why they stuck. And that's what happens, right? You Sometimes you stick just because you did something great together. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the, the, the LA, organization it, does that as well, right? I mean, that's like a thing that organizations well, do. Like They almost exactly. want to keep the band together, even if, you know what, have they played their last hit? Yeah. But let's just keep them together, you know? I, Steph, I hope that they don't become a product of that. They won't, and I think Steph is gonna Steph like what I said last week like Steph is going to get his and that's where he's at right now he's like whatever Clay you figure it out uh whatever Dre you figure it out whatever bench you figure it out I'm gonna get mine yeah. I'm gonna get my points I'm gonna still be one of the most dominant players in this league and I'm gonna make it so that people want to come play here but can they afford Kevin Durant and some of these other players 
Probably absolutely not. That's why Steve Kerr sees the writing on the wall. Like he's he's a smart coach. He played with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Like he knows the vibes. He played for Greg Popovich. Like he knows the vibes. Like, you know, he's a very smart dude. And he's like, this isn't going to work very much longer because the financial uh, the financial thing is is uh, going to be a challenge for us. We can't get the pieces we need. And we dumped off a lot because Steph, Draymond, and Clay need their money. You know, yeah, and un- but unfortunately, they're not getting that money's worth from anybody but Steph right now. And even though the starting five is doing great, part of their job is to get the rest of the team up to snuff and get them playing well. And like I said last week, that may mean Draymond going and playing with the second unit. I have no idea what needs to happen. Like, um, but they're missing something. There, there is something missing. And when they're on the road. They're not the same team when people aren't cheering for them. Yeah. And that is going to, I mean, we saw what happened with the Atlanta phase last year. They couldn't win a tournament, you know, because they were getting booed everywhere. So I, I hope it turns around. Um, they have, they're really close to having a winning record. Like they can go on a four game winning streak and then everybody yeah. will be like, oh, they got their, their juju back and their vibes. And, you know, we're speculating and all that kind of stuff, but they need to change something. Something needs to give. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it is. It's very, very quick, right, for, you know, the NBA world or whatever it is. Like, you know, sport world moves very fast. Like, it's possible that there is an overreaction and things do turn around. It's just the the long-lasting uh, effects of what appears to be a, a, a system that we felt like is good to go. Like, it was like, okay, this is definitely a good group of players, a consistent young, you know, talent that they have, and the fact that it's not working out. And it honestly doesn't show a whole lot of signs of improving is worrisome but again if we're talking about the nets if we're talking about the lakers we're talking about the warriors as three of the most talked about teams in the nba you would definitely rather be in the shoes of golden state right now there is no doubt about it speaking of teams let's jump into uh what has been an interesting tier list done by good old ben j nasim for the cdl uh he recently made his tier list uh coming into the season i didn't get a chance to watch the whole video but i didn't watch a majority of this video, uh, I do like the the way that he did describe uh, these four different categories: like uh, Sunday regulars, potential contenders, work to do, and missing pieces. Uh, so I don't know, Kingdom. First reaction, uh, I guess, whenever you see this list, is um, what? Uh, first reaction is I think that he's basing this off of scrims i believe that that's where he got the way he's putting things which is interesting that a lot of people are this is the same thing we've done with optic and phase the last three years right is we just put them in sunday regulars we put them in top two no matter what because obviously that's what they're built for you know uh and so i'm wondering if when it comes to ben nasim's list uh how realistic this list is he put Vegas in work to do after giving a speech about how well they were doing in scrims and how they were beating everybody in hard points and how they looked really good and and then kind of chalked it up to like, well, they looked really good last year and they're probably not going to do anything. And it's unfortunate. Like, I think this is a good start. I would have Florida and the Ravens in the same spot. Um, I might even put lag down there. Uh, yeah. And... I think that New York has work to do, but people are saying they're doing good in scrims. So, like, I guess I like this list. My question is, like, do I see these four teams that are in work to do and missing pieces not making champs? Because that's where they're being rated right now. Like, and so do I see Arcity's, you know, biggest earner in the history of the game not making champs? Um, Do I see Clayster and the gang not making champs? Florida and Ravens, unfortunately, <laughs> my worry you is... You foresee it. You foresee it. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm going to do. See you later. Gone fishing. No, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I think honestly, like as I look at this list, um, I think the LA Thieves are going to underperform. I think they're uh, going to be potential contenders. I think Optic is potential contenders. Uh, I don't think we know who the Sunday regulars are outside of the Atlanta phase. Don't sleep on the Seattle Surge and don't sleep on the Toronto Ultra. Okay, I, I'm with that. I will say this: this is kind of a uh, a question that's not really a question. Is almost like the LA Thieves, like the defending champions of last season, 
have to be S tier? You know, like, does that have to be the case? Um, I will say that, just throwing that question out there. Uh, not to say that I wouldn't have LA Thieves up there, because I personally would. Uh, the way that I would do this list is similar to the way that he did it as well. I think this is actually a very good list. Um, the problem that I foresee with, like, thinking about, you know what, do I foresee all four of these teams being in the bottom four? I mean, you could estimate or assume based off of, you know what, pre, pre, you know, the franchises have done for the last three seasons. You know, I don't expect them to make all these moves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, the way that you have to, to judge a tier list is very current because by the time that champs does roll around, 70% of these teams will be different in some way. Like, there is no That's facts. way to accurately describe. You know what? This LAG team, absolutely. Top four. Like, you don't know that. Like, you really, like there's, yeah. and there's no way to validate it either. Like, there's no way to say, you know what? Like, I could tell you what's going to happen to the Florida Mutineers this season, and you wouldn't believe me. Because I would tell you, okay, Florida Mutineers, they start off, you know what? They go three and one in major one. They go on, they finish top four. Then they go on, and they finish top 12. Then they make this massive roster change. Somebody get, like, that happens every season for every single team. If I came into the season and said, you know what? New York Subliners, major one, major two. Throughout the first four majors, they're not going to win a single series on land. But you know what? They're going to go to champs. You tell me I am an idiot. And that would be accurate. Um, so it's difficult to really describe where these teams are going to be in the future. I think, the, honestly, the way that you have to do these tiers is so current. Um, and I would say the disagreements that I might have with this list... I don't know if I would have Optic Texas in Sunday regulars. I, I know that based off of scrimmages, they sound like right now they might be uh, playing better uh, for the moment. I think that everybody is focused off the start. So maybe you could justify maybe putting them at the first slot of potential contenders. Uh, I still do have my questions on the fact that nearly half of this team was split apart. And we're all just like, yeah, they're back together. What are you talking about? Like, yeah, they love each other. It's like, yeah, but... 50% of the roster was nearly different and probably would have been different had it not been for Skump stepping up and saying, you know what, eh, maybe we made a mistake. Uh, so that is my my big worry uh, with Optic Texas, uh, I would say right now, to maybe not guarantee them to be in Sunday regulars. Uh, I did like how far up he did have Boston uh, because I feel like Breach did make some really good moves. I was a huge fan of the, of the Awakening addition uh, to this team. It feels yeah. like right now... And this is also another way that I would judge tiers is based off of AR talent. ARs currently uh, feel like the meta. Now that will change as the season progresses. There's no doubt about it. Um, so you do have to evaluate. You know what? ARs on different teams. How well? How you know? How well are those players going to play? You know, those are going to be your superstar players off the start of a title. You know, does that lower certain teams? Does that make you, you know, more worried in a team like the Seattle Surge, for example, like Accuracy and Sib? Do you like those those two as a pair? Do you like, uh, you know, Las Vegas Legion? Well, what? I mean, if Temp and Clayster are your ARs, that may make you, may make you like the Las Vegas Legion a little bit more. Uh, so I would say I would move Optic down. Uh, I would not have New York as high as he ended up having New York. Um, I'm a, I am a little worried about Minnesota in a few ways. Uh, I probably would have had Seattle a little higher, maybe Toronto a little higher in terms of the pecking order on the list that they were in. Uh, and then I think the bottom four, I would probably, I would probably agree with at this point. I think the LAG, you do have your concerns given the, you know, the, the primary core of this team, 75% of this roster, it feels like was up and down, uh, throwing RCs into this team, I think is a good move. I feel like it is a long-term move though. Um, and while there's a lot of hype around Las Vegas, we'll probably talk about them here in a little while. Uh, I don't think that they have earned their right necessarily to be at the top of everybody's list. Um, and then the same thing with Florida and right. London. Like I said, a lot of my, my power rankings or whatever it may be are based off of questions. London and Florida are without a doubt, two of some of the more questioned teams that I have, uh, right now in the league. So that's where I would kind of rank teams for the moment. Again, it's difficult to do these. It's difficult to kind of assess the way that the person was thinking about the list, um, because is it something that you're thinking about right now? Is it something that you're basing off of for the whole season? Um, because again, teams are going to fluctuate, and most importantly, Kingdom teams are going to be making lots and lots of roster changes. There is no doubt about that. 
So if I base this on the teams that I think will either not make roster changes or the ones they make will make their team better. If I like, I'm just going to be completely aches right now. Right. And go like, here's the top four going into champs, uh, Atlanta phase, optic, Texas, Seattle surge and Toronto ultra. The thing about optic that's interesting is to your point, if they're not doing well, they will make a trade and do well. Like this team, they kind of, fizzled off throughout the season last year, but they still were top four. You know, it's kind of like they just stay there because they're built that way. They're coached that way. Um, I don't think Rambo could coach a team that was top eight. Like, it would be weird, you know, like if they consistently placed fifth, sixth. It, 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 like, they did that one year in their history, and it, we all remember it, and it, we never want to talk about it again in World War II. Um, Atlanta phase, they'll make changes if they need to to be successful. If Slasher's not working out, they'll figure it out. They'll they'll get somebody else. Um Seattle Surge, the same, but I've heard in scrims, like, accuracy already has spots in the game that people call, like, oh, yeah. MR spots. Or oh, whatever. yeah. Like, <laughs> this dude is already, like, he's, and that just means if he can turret and if he can sit in a spot and pre-aim and do well, like, well, then, yeah, he's going to lead these guys, and then you've got freaking Pred running around in your face, and, like, a Shotzi, like a Hydra. Um, and the Toronto Ultra, I've heard that people are already like, yeah, Scrappy's Rookie of the Year. There's no, nobody's going to yeah. stop him. You know, like this dude is rookie of the year. And so it's like, well, if Scrappy can play well, which he got to back to back challengers champs. And if he didn't, he didn't get reverse swept in two best of fives and all that, like then he would have won last year and had two uh, challengers champs and challengers is tough. Like these guys play hard and they know all the spots, the nerd spots and everything. And they play well. Um, I think Scrappy is going to be a surprise. Those four teams in my mind are teams that, I would say right now, like to your point, you can't say who on the bottom is going to because of the changes, but the people at the top that I know, like I can guarantee they're going to make champs is those four teams. Like for sure, Atlanta phase, Optic Texas, Seattle Surge, and Toronto Ultra will be going to champs if it's for nothing else than the culture that they've built of winning and competing. I'm being very, it's, I, Toronto might be replaced by Boston. Uh, Not by LA they've changed their not well, LAT. Maybe they they I mean like Toronto changed their cult their coaching staff. They yeah, changed so true. much. If there's a top team that's gonna make a change earlier than the other top teams, I would say it would be LAT. So that's why I'm like not sure on LAT, because if they if it comes down to it, they will make a change when necessary, like they didn't last year because they just figured the game out at the end and beat everybody. Um so yeah, I would say I, I'm the ultra, if they didn't have scrappy, I wouldn't say it, but I think Scrappy, Pred, Shotzi, Simp, like these players in general. And that's the only reason I think that he has New York so high is because Hydra, I guess, is a hard kill in this game already. So yeah. we'll see. Yeah, I will say one thing that I would do if, you know, anybody wants to make power rankings out there. And obviously, if you're listening to it, you may have to check out the list. We, you know, we can list off all the teams, but I think we kind of already did it. Um, the one thing that I would do uh, is I would definitely evaluate the teams who have invested in challengers in terms of players who are on their bench. Like the two teams that I noticed that, that Ben did list pretty high on potential contenders is both Boston and New York. Boston and New York, who do they have on their bench? Boston has Beans and New York has Wardy. Two very, right. very talented players that I'm sure uh, I'm sure might be at certain points throughout the season. You know, I'm sure they're going to have their name called or at least people in the community will want to have their name called is, what, is really the way that I'm, I meant to describe it. Um, I think that that is a safer bet for sure is to really recognize what rosters that are out there. Uh, because like, again, we could talk about, oh, you know, this team can make a trade or this team can make a trade realistically, right? The Atlanta phase during the off season had problems trying to pick up certain players. They had to go for slasher optic, Texas. They wanted to make moves. And honestly, I think that they realized, I don't know if we can really make moves. Like, I don't know if we can grab X player, or I don't know if we can grab, you know, one of the best SMGs in the game just like that. Why? Because all of these teams will not bow down, right? They want to win just as much as everybody else does. Um, and so that is something that I would definitely look out for is that teams who are not built well, who will, who will, uh, who aren't like, I guess, kind of have that depth, the same conversation we've had when it comes into NBA, I guess it kind of relates here. A majority of teams in the CDO will make a move this season. Teams that are not prepared for that 
absolutely can start to fall by the wayside because again, you limit yourself. If you have an addition, if you have an academy team, LAG is a great example of that. They have an academy team that just looked great in the very first Challenger Cup. Certain teams are aware of the fact that, hey, odds are we're going to make a move this season. So let's make sure that when we do, we can go for a player that we feel confident in, not that we're going to scramble and look and think, oh my gosh, we need to make a player. We need to make a change. We need to do this. We need to do that. I would definitely value the teams um, that have built themselves from the bench, that have built themselves a good team, not just in the starting four, but also in that fifth slot, even in the sixth slot. And also teams as well uh, who are really highlighting when it comes down to their uh, their staff, right? When we talk about management, when we talk about coaches, when we talk about, um, you know, I know like the uh, Optic Texas obviously grabbed JP. Wonderful move to grab him as the analyst as well. Uh, I definitely would look at those rosters um, and see a little bit of a different element to them, a, a, a better spark, if you will, to what I believe will be a uh, a season that if there are hurdles, if there are craziness, crazy moves that end up happening, if we have a similar season to what we had in Vanguard, where basically everybody, or uh, we had a number of different teams win different events, um, et cetera, et cetera, that could be the move to make, uh, is, is to rank those teams higher than others. Yeah, I agree. Um, so somehow you said you were proud of us, you know, we were, uh, 20 minutes in and <laughs> got through, here we are, two topics <laughs> and now we're 50 minutes in and we've gone through four topics. <laughs> so like, I think we're, our, our topics are going longer, uh, than they did before. And so <laughs> if there's any of, if there's any of our upcoming topics that you want to rapid fire, like, let me know. I think there's some that we can answer pretty quickly um i'm curious though you know when it comes to the atlanta phase because we're talking about them right now yeah. like should there be a worry or is this you know they are normally one of the best scrim teams every year like at the beginning of the year they're one of the best like they beat everyone and i remember one time their scrim record was like they had only lost three scrims it was stupid yeah. it was something dumb like 50 to 3 it was like oh my gosh this team is going to annihilate everyone and they went on to do that uh my fear with a team that isn't doing well um and you've got slasher being slasher ban the m4 anything that makes people better than me i don't want it in the game <laughs> um like <laughs> like if like i am I'm, I'm wondering if that culturally matches phase and if they're going to be successful this year or if their struggles are deeper than just like figuring it out and they're actually going to be one of the teams that does make an early change what do you think yeah, like in terms of the question, like, am I worried about the Atlanta phase? No, I'm not worried about the Atlanta phase. Now, is there, you know, a level of concern that you can have about certain things? Yeah, sure. But like, I'm not like in relation to, uh, I know there's been questions about, you know, when we were able to scrim earlier, you know, a few days ago and stuff like that before season one ended up happening. Um, you know, they were dropping a few hard points, you know, to like Boston and to a few other teams as well. Like now is not the time to panic for any team before we've even played a single match. Like, you know, if, if you're worried about, I don't know, X team in the preseason of the NBA, that's fine. You can be worried about the preseason, but the preseason is called the preseason for a reason. It takes place prior to the actual season. Um, so with a high target team like the Atlanta phase for a roster that has, you know, just an unbelievable amount of talent, um, I would not be worried about this roster in the slightest. I, I think that they're... You know, you can have questions as the season progresses. I think that there are doubts, much like there are on every single CDL team. Uh, but I think for right now, when, when it comes down to Atlanta, again, you have a very, very talented roster. I think you did make the right pickup when it comes to Slasher. I don't think that there is a... If you're an Atlanta phase fan, you see, oh my gosh, we lost a few hard points to Boston. We lost a few hard points to Las Vegas. I don't think this is the time to press the panic button by any means. Now, if we get into Major 1, if we get into Major 2... Things aren't looking good. Players are starting to, you know, drop numbers that they shouldn't. That's the time where you start to bring up those things. But I think preseason game just came out. We're trying to figure out what weapons to run. We're trying to lower the, the sound of players' footsteps. We're trying to pick out the right maps to play. All of those things. No, I, I wouldn't at this point. So that's a good point. Um, kind of shifting away from Atlanta to Dallas. Uh, not the optic texas but um <laughs> the dallas mavericks you know we of course you know luca is okay so i'm just gonna say this out loud right 
and I'm going to get flamed for it. But like, I'm a person for that is a is a fan of a player rather than a team. And I've been scouting who my next replacement is for when LeBron retires. And I've kind of landed on Luca. And my son hates this. He just is like, Dad, that makes no sense. Like, how are you going to have, a, you know, be a fan of someone else? And you're like, you're just going to switch teams? And I'm like, absolutely. I'm going to be a <laughs> Dallas Mavericks fan or wherever Luca plays. Let's go. Um, and I've been watching Luca for years. He plays like LeBron to me. He's like a Steph LeBron mix. He's not as good at LeBron at jumping and dunking on people. He's not as good at Steph at shooting the three. But he's as good at LeBron as passing uh, when it comes to passing. And he's as good at Steph when it comes to getting his own shot. So it's like this perfect hybrid player who is unstoppable, but it doesn't make sense. And that's what LeBron has always been to me. It's like came into the NBA with this oddly shaped kid and seemed like he wasn't ever going to be a, have a jumper. And then he got one. And then he became dangerous. And then he became a threat. And then he added the three ball. And like, you know, his free throw shooting has not ever been amazing, but it's gotten better. Uh, and he became a better leader and he won multiple championships. He went to the finals eight years in a row. Um, Luka Doncic, uh, beating the Suns last year, the way that they, that yeah. whooping they gave the Suns in their own building in game seven, he has the grit, he has the grind. Um, could he go up against every team in the West this year and win? I don't know. The Grizzlies would probably give them a run for their money. The Warriors would, I would hope give them a run for their money, but it doesn't look like it. They would smoke the Lakers. They would smoke a lot of the teams, I think, on the West, uh, and then run into whoever's going to be waiting for them in the East. Um, I don't know if you saw this, Landon, but the three-pointer that he hit in the game against the Clippers to win by only two points, like, yeah. it, this was the dumbest, like, the ball just bounced to him, and he just instinctively chucked up a three from the side. Like, he was almost out of bounds. Just grabbed the ball, like, oh, look, the ball. Just shot it. It went in, and then he was like, shh, running down the court, like, be quiet, you know? And that there was, I think, a bajillion lead changes in that game. You know, like it was like, what's going to happen here? Um, who's going to win? And, you know, Paul George, PG-13, having a good game, like doing a good job. Um, but Luka Magic is magic. And it's this thing. And and he's a Slovenian. Like, he doesn't even fit the the kind of moniker of a popular player because he talks trash. He makes faces at people. Like, he, he he's not like your fun loving like Steph Curry or LeBron and he laughs when he makes a shot in your face yeah you know? and so it's like I like his grit and his grind and I think he is one of the more unstoppable forces and let me give a tip of the hat uh to Mark Cuban to go from right? Dirk Nowitzki to Luka Doncic like to go from generational talent amazing player hall of famer to generational talent amazing player hall of famer and to pick that talent and to have eyes on someone from another country that would make a lot of sense uh within the nba system like gg good job and the pieces he's put around luca are really good you know and so uh i'm my question for you is how good is luca right he's leading the nba right now in points scored um he scored like I think 220 points in six games. It's ridiculous. Um, leading the NBA, he's also second in the NBA right now in steals. Like this guy is just playing yeah. exceptional right now. My question for you is, how good is Luka Doncic? Like, I don't know. It, it is weird. Like the way that you were describing Luka is is accurate, but at the same time, I was like, yeah, like that makes sense, but it doesn't. Like it's it's so weird. Like you can't <laughs> really describe. Luka Doncic in terms of like, oh yeah, he plays like this. He plays like that. Like he really is a master of like the ISO. He's a master of unbelievable shot making. Uh, he's able to use every single pound that he has. And oftentimes people, you know, do make fun of the fact that, you know, he isn't super skinny. He isn't, you know, just <laughs> running, you know, he's going to run up and down the court. He's not like a magic Johnson in terms of like, you know, he wants to, push the pace, do all these crazy passes. Like, can he do some of those things? Absolutely. But he's not like that. Like every time I see Luca, it feels like you said, very similar to LeBron where it is like, Hey, I'm going to on average get the best shot possible. And if that means that I'm yes. going to back you down to make sure that I can just get a layup or just kind of shoot it over you from 10 feet away, I'm going to do that. If that means that I have to shoot this, 30 footer that's gonna you know skyrocket into the into the basket i'm gonna do that um but i will say 
honestly one of the best touches as well I think that we've ever seen from like a player like the like yeah. the touch that he has he feels unbelievably comfortable around the rim all the time uh and really to to answer the question how good is Luca honestly as good as Luca wants to be uh my only mm-hmm. thing that I think could hold Luka Doncic back potentially long term is teammates uh, I think that you do have to have a good team um progressively as your career goes on i know the dallas hits pretty well right now so that's not really going to be a current problem but it is a positive right luka Doncic is somebody that we're already talking about uh who very similar to lebron is like you know what he may not have all-star type of teammates but it seems going to be good he seems going to make it to the playoffs yep. and honestly he's going to put up some unbelievable numbers along the way like it is scary how good he is and how early in his career he is. Like, he's 23. He's 23 That's years old. Bananas. And he's averaging nearly 35 points. 34.4. <laughs> I just want to double check. 34.4. Nearly nine rebounds and eight assists. Like, That's those LeBron. are Braun numbers, but slightly <laughs> elevated. Yeah. And he is 23. That's actually bananas. And it's interesting if you think about the fact that this team gave up KCP. Because he couldn't play well with Luca. Yeah. Like that, like they literally gave up another generational piece. I wouldn't say KCP's generational, but they gave up another great player um, because he couldn't play with Luca. Yeah. So here's my question, and I'm going to put you on the hot seat here. Okay. I'm with it. You're starting, a, you're starting a franchise. You got to pick a point guard, Luca or Steph. If I'm starting a franchise, meaning I've never existed before. They're right. Sure. Yes. Luca. Let's just say you, okay. Oh, Luca. Wow. Yeah. Luca. No, no question about it. Like I said, I that is not to take away anything at all from Steph Curry, right? Because I love Steph. Uh Steph is without question, and I don't care what anybody says. I, I hate when people even be like, ah, I don't know. Steph Curry's the greatest shooter of all time. There was no debate about it. No one should ever debate the fact that he is the greatest shooter of all time. There's no question about it. 100%. Um, however, if I am starting a franchise. And I am looking for a key piece that can be here for a long time. You go with Luca, right? Would I rather have the next ten years of Luca's career or the next ten years of Steph's career? I don't know if Steph's been playing in ten years. I know, if, good and well, Luca Doncic at the age of thirty-three is still going to be balling. Oh yeah, probably oh, putting up thirty points per game uh, and playing incredibly well. Like I said, the only thing that you might have a question about is how well Luca can play with other players. Um, so that is a major positive for somebody like Steph, right? He can be past the ball. He can, you know, be a spot up shooter. Luca, I don't know how well he would fit necessarily with all of these guys, but at the same time, that's a risk that I'm willing to take. I am happy to take a 35 point, nine rebound, eight assists, 23 year old. Uh, I would take that every day of the week. And I think that most people probably would. Now other players that I would take maybe over Luca at this moment, I don't know. Like the only guy that I personally would even think about, I don't know about you, I know is Giannis. Oh, that's, that's it. I thought you were, oh, okay. You're not doing point guard. I thought you were going to say. Like, oh, that's right. Sorry, point something. guard. Point guard. Okay. We're talking about point yeah, guard. Yeah, yeah. But I'm saying yeah. in general, Giannis player is, unstoppable. is Giannis. Yeah. But Luca's like, right, like I don't know, man. Like Luca's creeping up on that list. I think it's a it's a difficult conversation to have because again, I'd love to see Luca with like an absolute all star piece next to him. I hope it's not a situation where it's difficult to like play alongside of him. But I think given his passing skills, like we already talked about, he can do oh, it. He can do it everywhere. Like I said, like, and, and what a, what a defensive nightmare he would be is if you did have a solid player, you know, we're talking like an all-star caliber player alongside of him who is a shooter, right? He can just back somebody down. He's already oversized his point guard. He can just pass it out. Or, like I said, he can receive those crazy passes. And the best thing, as you mentioned, is that he loves the big moment and he loves to let you know about it. I think that as a uh, as a <laughs> starting off of a franchise, you'd have to go with him. But what is your what is what is your take on that? Would you go with Steph in this case? Uh, Luka Doncic, not even it wouldn't even be close. And I don't care if they were the same age because when Steph was this age, he wasn't as good. You know, He's probably still in um, college. You know? <laughs> it, it, like, <laughs> Well, when, when he would just got out of Davidson and he was like That's this right. little scrappy kid that was yeah. LeBron was dropping three point game winners on like this. LeBron was running the league when Steph came into the league and it was yeah. clear it wasn't even Steph wasn't even in remotely in the conversation. Luca's been in the conversation since he came in of being like, who is this kid? 
and what is he doing? Right. And how is he so hard to guard? He is unguardable. He is literally an unguardable player. And here's what's funny and why I was laughing so hard when you were talking. It's like, Luca actually plays like an old man. So when, <laughs> in, in 10 years, he's still going to be backing people down and unguardable because yeah. he already plays like that. He already plays like he can't jump. Like, and that's hilarious to think about. Steph kind of does too, but Steph's little. In, and he's buffer. Like Steph's got some muscles. I don't know if I'd say know. Steph plays. I wouldn't like want to see him on the court. You no, see how I'm much he's running he plays around like an there? old man. That's well. What I'm saying is he doesn't jump. He, he's not depending on the. Dunk, oh, I see. What you're you saying. know, okay. like LeBron still, which makes no sense to me, yeah. is still dunking on people at his age. It's it doesn't make any sense. Like you know, and he's gonna have to slow down with these groin injuries because I need to see this dude break the record this year. He had to make 16 per game to get it, and he's missing games. So I'm like, hey, bro, like get it together. Uh, before we close, like and everything, like I, you mentioned, Giannis. Um, he was he was interviewed and people were talking about you know hey where do you place yourself are you the best do you think of yourself do you see how dominant you are and I want to read his quote you know and this yeah. is how he responded he said no LeBron is still playing Steph just won a championship KD is still hooping Embiid is killing which yeah Embiid is fifty six pointer this year or whatever that yeah, was uh, insane yep <laughs> Jokic back to back MVP Luca Magic there's a lot of people out there. My question for you, Landon, is, is he being honest? Is this, is this humility? And is Giannis actually being humble? Or is he posturing because he just is be playing the smart card and he doesn't see himself as being as dominant as he actually is and as unstoppable as he actually is? So, well, I think that this is, uh, because I actually, I, I did not see, I'm actually just reading this quote for like one of the first times. My instant reaction to that is I believe that this is one of two things for Giannis. I think this is him basically saying, truly giving respect to other people, right? You know, like, hey, LeBron's still playing. Oh, yeah, Steph Curry just won a championship. KD is still hooping, Luka Magic, like all these things. Right? Mm -hmm. I think he's giving respect because he has done that before. Right? There's been, uh, he's, he's been asked before, like, you know, do you think you're the best player in the world? And he, you know, gives his props to LeBron. He is more than willing to uh, say that there are other great players out there. Um, so I think it is an attribute of him just truly being, um, you know, just unselfish at the same time. I also think that there is an element of, I want to remain the underdog. I want to remain a guy who is going to be talked about, who is going to be discussed. Uh, but ultimately I, not that I don't want you to think about me, but I want to come in and I want to surprise you. Like that's, that's the. That's the vibe that I get from Giannis. I feel like he mm. wants to come in, dominate, and then get out. That's that's the way that I look at the way that he is as a person. I always come up with all kinds of quotes about like what he wants to do is he wants to become like Tim Duncan at some point. Yeah, that's what, gonna, that's what I was going to call. He's like he wants up. to be Tim Duncan. Like at some point when basketball is over, I just want to disappear. I don't want to talk to you guys anymore. Um, so I think that he I, does think about the game differently, right? Like I, I think he's willing yeah. to give props to other people, which you know is is good. So I think there is that honesty. Uh, you know, in his upbringing and things like that, where it comes from. But I also think it's an element of like, you know what? I'm going to give props to these guys. I'm not going to be somebody who's going to come out here and say, I am the best player ever. And just waits for just an array of light to just beam on. I don't think he's one of those guys. But I think it's there is wrong, an element basically. of, you know what? Let me just kind of stay over here. Let you guys talk about LeBron being the best. Talk about, you know, all these up and coming guys. And let me and the Bucks surprise you once playoff time happens. I mean, I think he could, you know, he's going to win two to three more championships. He um, better. He better. Yeah, I, I think. The Bucks better provide him with that. They, he'll win two to three more championships. And he almost left a couple of years ago. And basically, like, you got to put better people around me. You know, like, I'm unstoppable, obviously. But I want to play on a team. I want to be a part of a team. And that that Tim Duncan call out is hilarious. Because when he said that, he was like, who knows where Tim Duncan is? I was like, yeah, that's a good point. Like, where is Tim Duncan? Like. <laughs> He's not on TV. He's not on inside the NBA. He's not doing interviews. He is ghost. Like that dude just left. Like, and hey, for that, it's been for nice. that very reason though, right? You didn't know one of those. One of those. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> another reason why you might pick Giannis as like your piece to start off with uh, is not just because of his unbelievable talent. It's not because he's generational. It's not because of this, not because of that, but it's also because of the fact that like his player makeup, like, Imagine if you had a Tim Duncan-like personality 
easy to work with, a guy who wants to be with the franchise, somebody who literally just who wants to work hard and dominate. Like, imagine how many franchises, if you were able to tell them, like, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you this player. I'm going to give you this guy. You know what, Kevin Durant? You want Kyrie Irving? Do you even want LeBron James? You yeah. might say yes, but are you ready to take on all of the drama that comes with it? How much drama is on Giannis? Nothing. <laughs> there is no Good. drama on Giannis at all. And it's yeah. because I think of all these attempts that he makes to try to make sure that it doesn't happen. Is part of it because he's over in Milwaukee all the time? Absolutely. But I think that is also a major reason why so many franchises fiend for a player like Giannis is honestly, like I said, just because it's like having Tim Duncan on your team. Like It's literally like having somebody who's just going to hang out, somebody who's going to be unbelievably gifted, one of the probably will be, ends up as one of the best players of all time, in my opinion, uh, and is ready to, to go off into the sunset. Like, cool. That was it. I don't know. That's why I look at it. Yeah. I would take I that. Right. I think a lot of teams would take that right now. I think a lot of teams would have, uh, would, would give a lot up to, to kind of uh, cool off a little bit when it comes oh, down. The Warriors would drop drama. Draymond, Clay Thompson, <laughs> Jordan Puddle, and oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> um, Mr. Unwiseman, and they would go oh, to... <laughs> And they would pick up Giannis, and Giannis and Steph would be unstoppable, you know. And I think that's what Katie and and Kyrie thought they could do. But Kyrie is a walking ball of drama. Yeah, you know, he is a literal walking ball of drama. Yeah, um, 100%. yeah. I, I. So I don't know if we want to end here. Like, yes. you know, we've got let's a, do it. Let's do it. Jillian, other topics, but we're over an hour, and uh, the people are going to want more. They can come back next week because it's, it's true. I need to talk about. There is, there is indeed. Uh, if you guys did. Enjoy this episode. I know we, we kind of came to an abrupt halt, but like we said, we had so many topics that we wanted to jump on. We're really trying to figure in the middle of the show. Should we talk about this? Should we talk about that? Should we? <laughs> ah, maybe we'll save that for next week. Ah, this is actually we're really going to talk about right now, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but let us know, guys. Feel free. Let us know what your thoughts are on the podcast improvements. Uh, honestly, just any feedback at all. We more than welcome it. However, you're listening to this, wherever you're watching this from, uh, you, know, you can catch us. On Twitter, at Lando, at Kingdom underscore Soldier uh, on Twitter. As long as it still exists, and maybe by the time that you watch this, we don't have Twitters. And at that point, well, uh. give us a call. I don't know. Try <laughs> try to find us somewhere. Maybe Instagram still exists by that point. I have no idea. Uh, but any closing regards, Kingdom, before we do end out the second installment of Under One Roof? Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my dad, when I was nine, gave me a book, a magic book. And uh, I learned a couple card tricks that I've used my right. whole life and to impress people with my magic. And uh, it's one of those things that always catches people's eye and they never expect it. Kind of like Luka Doncic. That's it? I thought you were out to do a magic trick for us. Nope. That's it. All right. Well, okay. I was, I was kind of hoping maybe, maybe next week you could pop up. Where's that uh, magic book now? Is it anywhere? Not bad, honestly. I will take that. I'm I'm a sucker for magic. Now, audio <laughs> listeners are just very confused as for what just happened. Hey, what and just we happened? Will, we're going to make you have to YouTube, tune in. Guys. You're going to have to yep. watch it. Sorry, we're making you do something this week. You're going to have to watch uh, and maybe grade the magic trick. Feel free to uh, to let us know what you thought of that one. Maybe we'll make it a weekly installment. Kingdom's magic trick. Oh no idea what gosh. you just got yourself into. Uh, but that's going to do it for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure to uh, to follow us here on the channel. Make sure to like, comment. And subscribe. A lot more content coming here on the channel uh, when it comes down to Call of Duty content and things like that. Uh, like I said, make sure to follow us on the socials. Make sure to stay tuned for next week on episode number three of Under One Roof. We'll see you next time.